Hi, everybody, and welcome to this introduction to Elixir Talk. My name is Michael Zornick. Before we get started, a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a developer and teacher from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I work for myself doing a mixture of contracting and other projects. Uh, you can find more information about me uh, on my personal website, mikezornick.com. Uh, I've been using Elixir for about three years now on um, solo projects as well as some client projects, and uh, I really like it. I often find myself uh, explaining Elixir to friends who know me from other tech spaces like iOS, and so I thought it would be good to do a short introduction talk. So what is Elixir? Uh, I like to describe Elixir as this. Uh, Elixir is a dynamic functional language designed for building scalable and maintainable applications. Elixir leverages the Erlang VM, often called the Beam, which is known for running low latency, distributed, and fault tolerant systems. So before we get started, a little history of the origins of Elixir. Uh, Elixir was started by uh, Jose Valin, the creator of Elixir, and he started this as a research and development project for Platform Attack. Uh, the goals included the ability to enable higher uh, extensibility and productivity in the Erlang VM while keeping compatibility with the uh, Erlang ecosystem. Now, Erlang was built by these uh, three gentlemen, Robert, Mike, and Joe. Uh, it was developed at a company called Ericsson, which used it for phone software. Uh, early on, it was proprietary. Uh, and then in 1998, it was open sourced um, and became uh, the source of Elixir today. Now, if you're looking for more information on, on Erlang, uh, I have one movie you can check out on YouTube uh, called Erlang the Movie is the short, uh, approximately 11 minute demo where the three of them kind of go over the system, talk a little bit about how it has uh, fault tolerance and it has hot deployment features. And um, it's just kind of a fun uh, thing to kind of check out. So coming back to my description of Elixir, uh, there's a lot of big words in there. And so uh, one of the ways I, which I thought we could kind of explore what Elixir is, is to kind of look at each one of those terms and talk about how Elixir uh, exemplifies uh, that word. So in this presentation, you will see some code use, um, but keep in mind the goal of this presentation is not necessarily to teach you Elixir, but more to explain the high level concepts of the language uh, with the main goal of basically whetting your appetite. So you kind of want to play around with it and learn some more. So the first term I'd like to talk a little bit about is uh, Elixir being a functional language. Now, if you have not had the pleasure, a functional language differs from an object-oriented language in that it is very much against the concepts of mutable state. Instead of objects which hold mutable state and define behavior, we instead create a stateless function that takes in a simple input and generates an output, and there are no side effects. And the idea is that you can call this function with the same input over and over, and you will get the same output over and over again. <laughs> Removing uh, the complexities of state help reduce a lot of bugs when it comes to uh, bigger systems. And I will say, like as a long-time object-oriented programmer myself, um, it does take a little bit of re time to kind of rethink how to solve common problems with functional programming. Um, but the good news is that once you actually get over that hump, um, you tend to like it and I myself really like it a lot and have brought a lot of what I've learned in functional Elixir even into my more object oriented systems like Swift. But um, so here's a, a quick example of what Elixir looks like. Uh, we have here a function called hello, which will take in a name and return a concatenized message. Uh, we will contain this hello function inside of a module called greeter. And then if we want to call this, we will just call greeter.hello and we'll pass in the name Sean and we will get back the message, uh, hello, Sean. You'll notice uh, IEX in the slide and that basically stands for the Elixir REPL, which lets you run um, short snippets of Elixir to kind of get a sense of how things go. Uh, you can also use IEX to attach it to a running uh, process and kind of inspect it. Um, and we'll be using IEX for a lot of our demo code. And once you have IEX installed on your machine, you can copy and paste a lot of these code samples here. So as I mentioned, we use functions in a functional language and to solve a problem, you will often need to call multiple functions in a row. Now in a standard language, you may uh, 
group these in such a way so like if you in in the top example here if you wanted to call uh, other function and then pass that output to new function and then pass that output to baz you would have to kind of nest the functions uh, inside of each other but elixir has this great feature called the pipe operator which basically lets you kind of chain functions together and so what happens is is the output of one function becomes the first parameter input of the next function so you can kind of just chain things together and it it generates some very nice readable code once you kind of take advantage of that kind of organizational structure so here's an example let's take the string module and the split function where we pass it a simple string elixir rocks we will split that with the space uh which is the default and then we will get back a, a list with the two elements. Now, if you wanted to call that with the pipe operator, you could just pipe the string Alexa rocks to string dot split, and you'll get the same output. Here's a second example. Uh, here we'll continue to split a string, uh, but now we will split using a semicolon and we'll get basically the same type of result. Now, when you're using the pipe operator, oftentimes instead of piping on a single line, you'll pipe it on a series of lines, creating this um, vertical look. And so here uh, we'll take our string, we'll pipe it into upcase, and then we'll pipe it into split. Notice we're passing the semicolon in here, and even though it kind of looks like the first parameter because we're using the piper operator, it'll actually be the second parameter. Um, and so we end up with a capitalization of uh, bread, milk, and eggs. Now, the second big term I wanna talk about is uh, dynamic and how Elixir is a dynamic language. And the easiest way to kind of describe this is basically to say that Elixir is not a strictly, a strict typed language. So there are two general concepts um, that most languages usually lean towards one or the other. There is a strict typing where the compiler will force type rules at compile time, whereas weak or dynamic typing does not have such rules. And in fact, you can take advantage of a dynamic runtime uh, in many different patterns. Um, there is not one best practice. Both of them can lead to solid software. My personal observation is that when you are learning how to program a strict language uh, might help you avoid some early pitfalls. But once you're more experienced and know how to apply things like unit testing and other good practices, um, Dynamic tapping can actually enable you to create some very productive designs. So here's an example of Elixir being dynamic um, and some cases of how it can fail. So let's say you have a the hello function which takes in the name. Uh, we will call greeter.hello by passing an integer six or a Boolean true. And we will actually get a runtime error, in this case a very specific an augment error. And we can handle that with different you know tools available to us but that's basically how elixir can fail you know being a dynamic language now there are some ways you can balance this uh, one of the tools that elixir provides is the at spec declaration and with this you can basically declare some expectations about the function so in here we'll basically say that we expect hello to accept a string and return a string and now that we've added the spec declaration we can actually find a compiler error. So if we try to compile this application, uh, we'll be told a uh, greeter at line eight, undefined function, hello, um, hello six. Uh, we will show the call for hello six, but assume it's there. Um, and this kind of shows you how you can kind of find a balance where you can still have uh, a dynamic system when you want it, but if you want to force um, some roles, uh, you can actually do that as well. There are other tools like Erlang's dial dialyzer, <laughs> I always say that wrong, which is a static analysis tool that identifies uh, software uh, discrepancies such as uh, uh, type errors or code that has become dead or unreachable because of you know programming error, um, unit tests that don't make any sense anymore. Um, a lot of times these tools will run alongside uh, things like VS Code and can give you some really good analysis. You can also run them as part of your CI system. Um, suffice to say that I think Alexa really does find a good balance between being a dynamic language with some tooling that lets you enforce types, um, but at the same time letting you be dynamic and handle, um, use those patterns when you really want to.
So speaking of those patterns, uh, <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about pattern matching. And this is actually one of the first things that I was learning about Elixir that really kind of um, kind of showed me that there was some new, fresh ways to kind of think of things. So uh, in Elixir, the uh, equal sign is not uh, the typical assignment operator. Instead, it's called the pattern match operator. And the basic idea comes from the uh, world of numbers and algebra, where um, when you have an equal sign, the basic idea is that you want to balance both sides of the equation, and you want to make sure that both sides of the equation are equal. Um, and so a similar thing happens uh, with Elixir. So here, uh, Elixir will uh, attempt to match the values on the left-hand side with the values on the right-hand side. And if the match succeeds, it will return the value of the equation. Otherwise, it'll throw an error. So in this case, because we've included x on the left side, x will uh, be assigned the value of 1, but it is done through a pattern match. Uh, a second example here will show you that we can have um, 1 on the left and now x on the right. Now x currently being 1, uh, 1 does equal 1, so this pattern will match. Now here, uh, if we put the value 2 on the left and x is still having the value of 1, now we will actually have a match error and that'll be obviously a problem. Um, the other thing to keep in mind too is that when you're using pattern matching, um, the variable, if you're doing assignment, needs to be on the left. If you put an unallocated variable on the right, it has no value, it cannot uh, perform the match. In this case, it's actually looking to um, think of y as actually a function, but that's just because y was never defined. Now, um, there's a lot more to matching um, in this demo. Um, I don't really want to pretend that this is a full demonstration of it, but um, suffice to say that matching is used in many different uh, ways. It's used in uh, simple logic, it's used in function ar arguments, it's used in conditional statements, and it's a, it's a huge part of the language, and it actually opens the door to a lot of interesting ways to solve problems. So um, basically just want to hint at it here. <laughs> We're not going to teach all the pattern matching, but so suffice to say that it's, uh, it's something that makes Elixir uh, very unique. So when it comes to pattern matching, one of the actual uh, patterns you'll see in code is you'll have a function, and when the function returns, it'll actually return a tuple. And a tuple is just a simple collection of values and uh, in this case, basically, when the function is successful, it'll return a tuple that starts with this OK atom, and then the value that you know the function was supposed to actually generate. And if it was successful, it'll have OK value, and if it was a failure, it'll have error, the error atom, and then usually the reason for why it failed. So the final topic I'd like to talk about when we're talking about how Elixir is a dynamic language is the metaprogramming tools uh, of Elixir. So metaprogramming is the process of using code to write code. Uh, it's common use case is to help you build uh, things called DSLs, which are domain-specific languages. And uh, as you learn metaprogramming, you'll actually discover that Elixir itself is actually built with a lot of its own metaprogramming tools. Um, but DSLs can be used to create a very concise, uh, hopefully readable uh, types of code. And so here's an example. Um, where there is a Elixir tool called Ecto, and Ecto is a um, database uh, abstraction system. And so here, Ecto has done some metaprogramming so that you can use keywords like schema and field to help define um, those properties of the Ecto system, and it helps make the code uh, very readable. Uh, if you're into uh, you know metaprogramming, Elixir is definitely a good candidate. Uh, it's got really good tools. And yeah, just wanted to give a quick shout out to metaprogramming. Okay, so the next big term we want to kind of talk a little bit about is scalable. And how is Elixir a scalable language? And to do this, we first need to talk a little bit about the process. So in Elixir, everything is a process. Um, processes are run in the Erlang VM. They are extremely lightweight, and they run across all the CPUs. And while they might seem like native threads at first, they're actually much simpler 
And it's actually not uncommon to have thousands of concurrent processes in an Elixir application. So a process is this unit of work. Uh, it is made up of a couple components. One is a thing called a mailbox. The other is typically a piece of state. Um, now this state is still value-based. It's not an object. There's no references to this elsewhere. Um, but the basic idea is that processes will send messages to each other. And these messages are typically very simple uh, values. And as messages are uh, received, they are put into a mailbox. And then you can evaluate messages as they come in to perform different uh, types of work. So here is an extremely uh, simple <laughs> example of a process. We've got a module called example. Uh, it implements a function called listen. This function is recursive. Uh, Elixir does have tools uh, to make recursive work better and not generate a large uh, call stack. So you can look into that more if you're interested. Uh, and the basic idea is we call receive and receive will basically fill, go through each message that is currently in the mailbox. And if it finds one that it, it understands, in this case, we're looking for messages like OK Coffee or OK Tea, uh, it can then execute some behavior uh, appropriate to that message. Now, if there are no messages in the mailbox uh, matching any of the patterns, the current process will wait until a matching message arrives. Uh, you can also apply timeouts if you need to, and processes are very configurable in lots of different ways. Uh, I'll leave that for uh, external reading. So here we spawn a process uh, using the example module. We uh, then send in a message. It recognizes the message and performs the behavior, in this case, printing the message coffee time. In our second send, we send a message it will not know, and so nothing happens. Uh, notably, the message will remain in the mailbox, uh, which can actually help you during debugging. Now, it's important to note that the process that sends the message does not block on send. It simply puts the message in the recipient's mailbox and continues. Uh, you can also think about processes as sending messages to itself. Um, so over time, you could have a process that actually goes through um, a different set of state as it accomplishes you know, some more complex work. Now, this slide might be a little overwhelming, but I will try to walk you through it. Uh, each process uh, runs in the Beam, uh, Beam being the Erlang virtual machine. Now, by default, the Beam will use as many process schedulers as there are CPU cores available. So for example, on a quad-core machine, you will end up with four schedulers. Now, each scheduler runs on its own thread, and the entire VM runs in a single OS process. Now, a scheduler is in charge of the interchangeable execution of the process, meaning that each process gets an execution time slot. Uh, after that time is up, the running process is preemptive, and the next one takes over. Uh, this is really important because this makes sure that a single process can never you know, run away and hog the entire scheduler. Um, it'll get some time to run, but if it needs more time, it'll just wait inside of the scheduler queue and get more time kind of like in the next heartbeat of the system. So in this example, with a single OS process and four CPUs, uh, you actually get a fairly concurrent system. Now, if you need to scale this, uh, there are two basic ways. Uh, one is to just add more CPUs to the server, and this will scale your application with absolutely no changes. Um, the second way is to actually distribute the beam across multiple computers. Uh, this is a little bit more of a high-end uh, Erlang VM situation, but it has definitely shown success in lots of uh, applications. And once you distribute the beam, um, it can take advantage of all the servers you connect to on its network. One of the questions that has come up in past performances of this talk is how does this relate to Docker? And it is true that the ideals of Docker containerization do conflict with some aspects of the Beam, like distributed Beam or the hot deploy system, which is a feature that lets an app uh, update in place uh, while running with zero downtime. Um, in the end, it really depends on your needs. Uh, I feel like it's perfectly reasonable to deploy an Elixir app inside of a Docker image to get started. And if you're comfortable with those tools, uh, when you do need to scale, you will have options. You can do it through Docker-isms or you can do it with distributed Beam. Uh, the fact is, um, you know, the Beam is so performant, you'll probably get by uh, a lot longer with your single container 
uh, than you would have if uh, you were using Rails or Java. But, you know, a lot of this is dependent on your project, so it's tough to have a crystal ball for what you will specifically need. Uh, the end result is that Elixir uh, has options. So our next big word uh, that we want to talk a little bit about is fault tolerance. And again, we'll bring up the process. So uh, processes have a thing called a supervisor. And now a supervisor is just a very specialized process that has a single purpose, which is the monitoring of other processes. Um, these supervisors can enable fault tolerant applications by automatically restarting child processes when they fail. In fact, you'll quickly learn that Elixir promotes a let it crash philosophy uh, to fail as quickly as possible so the supervision uh, can keep the system healthy at all times and will report abnormalities as they happen. Now, you can use a supervisor to observe a single process or multiple processes. And you can create uh, supervisors to supervise other supervisors. So you can create an entire tree of supervision. Uh, in general, when you develop complex systems, you should employ supervisors to do your error handling and recovery. Uh, in a properly designed supervision tree, you can uh, limit the impact of unexpected errors and the system will you know, hopefully recover. Uh, it's also worth noting that OTP, uh, which is a standard name for the tooling of Erlang, uh, provides logging facilities, so processes uh, that crashed are logged, so you can see that something went wrong. Uh, it's even possible to set up event handlers that will be triggered uh, on every process crash, thus allowing you to perform custom actions, such as sending email or reporting to an external system. Uh, supervision of processes is really great, and it can make for some very uh, fault-tolerant uh, systems. Now, uh, the next big word is latency. <laughs> And I'm not going to go into this too much. Suffice to say that uh, Elixir and Erlang are fast. Uh, here is an article that was posted uh, back in 2016, which did some comparisons of Phoenix versus other popular systems of the day. Uh, in this, uh, they observed a throughput of approximately 24,000 requests a second uh, with a 99th percentile latency below one millisecond. Uh, it was very fast, and <laughs> that was great. Uh, also, if you're really interested in latency of um, Erlang compared to other languages, um, this is a repo you could check out. This is not a complete uh, comparison, but it's definitely a good start, uh, where they basically have a bunch of systems for different languages and environments, and they have um, some sample scripts so you can run against them. And some of, the, some of these platforms have been profiled and they have their numbers below. And you can kind of see how um, Elixir and Erlang compare. It's definitely not the fastest, but it is definitely in, you know, the top tier of languages. And, um, yeah, so if low latency is interesting to you, uh, definitely check out those resources. The final uh, big keyword I want to talk a little bit about is uh, maintainable. So I believe Elixir apps are maintainable, and here's a couple examples of how that is the case. So uh, one of the ways uh, is including helpful debugging tools like the Observer. So the Observer is a graphical user interface, uh, which is capable of deploy uh, displaying the supervision trees, as well as providing you different information about processes. Um, you can go right in there and look at mailboxes and state. Uh, you can restart processes, um, do all kinds of fun things. The really cool thing is that uh, the Observer, you can do this locally during development, and you can actually do it in production as well. So you can go into production, open Observer that connects to the production system, and get a live readout of what's going on and what the state of you know different components are. Uh, you know, manually restart components if needed, although if you've got supervision proper, then that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, if you're just getting started with Elixir and you're trying to start the Observer locally, uh, you can run IEX and call observer.start, and that'll run it for you. So the next way in which Elixir is a maintainable language uh, is the fact that Elixir is stable. Uh, Elixir does continue, obviously, to see bug fixes and small improvements, but the language is considered very stable with no plans for any large 2.0 breakage or anything like that. Uh, the Erlang system it runs on top on has, you know, over 30 years of stability under its hood and yeah i mean elixir is you know at that stage of development where it's definitely over the hump and there's you know a good community out there with you know help and resources um so definitely uh, consider that 
another couple of exa- quick examples of maintainability. I'll quick, a quick shout out to the Hex um, library system. So uh, Hex is Elixir's package manager of choice. And there are tons of packages out there for both Elixir and uh, the Erlang systems, respectively. Uh, I'll also give a shout out to the documentation tools. Uh, they produce some really good docs. And of course, there's lots of good documentation written out there by the community itself. Uh, one of the really nice things I've discovered uh, writing my own docs is there's actually a system um, in the documentation for one, you can provide, you know, a code sample. So if you're writing some code that kind of demonstrates something, you can put that right in the documentation. And then you can actually run unit test against the sample code, uh, <laughs> which is a really neat idea that I hope other languages start to pick up. Alexa itself uh, is popular. So this was from last year's uh, Stack Overflow um, survey on the most loved, dreaded, and wanted languages. You can see Elixir up there in the top 10, uh, somewhere around eight, I believe. And yeah, and so Elixir, um, if you're thinking about it, has a couple notable projects that can get you started. Uh, if instead of just, you know, you can use Elixir obviously straight up, but uh, you can also use uh, the project Phoenix for building web apps. Uh, Ecto for communicating with databases, uh, Broadway for generating data processing pipelines, uh, Absinthe for crafting GraphQL APIs, and you can use Nerves for creating uh, embedded software on things like Raspberry Pis or smaller devices uh, using Nerves. So a couple of learning resources. Of course, we've got the Alexa language itself, uh, alexalang.org. There's a great getting started section, which has links to tons of resources, as well as a very simple guide, uh, which kind of walks you through the basics of the language. I'll then give a quick shout out to Elixir School, which is another great website that provides a kind of a more thorough review of Elixir's basic and advanced systems. For books, uh, one of the ones that we've read recently in my uh, book club was Elixir in Action. And that's a really good book that not only kind of goes over some of the simple Elixir, you know, features, but actually gives you a more of a deep dive into the Erlang VM and really understand how that works. If you like videos, uh, you can check out the Pragmatic Studio. They've got a video series which introduces Elixir itself, as well as a couple other series which use Elixir as, as one component to build a bigger, you know, web system. And then for conferences, uh, the main conference is ElixirConf. Uh, which you can find archives for on YouTube. Uh, There's also other Elixir conferences which are linked uh, from the main language website as well. So with that, uh, I want to thank you all for watching. Hopefully that helped you out. If you have any Elixir questions, definitely reach out for me. Uh, Again, you can check out uh, my website, mikezornick.com. I am also on uh, microblog and Twitter with the at Zorn handle. So thanks again. Hope you have a good night, and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.